anyway, it's my great pleasure to have four panelists today. Uh, the first one is uh, Jim uh, Balhoff from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, we also have um, Oliver Hay from the University of Michigan. I think all of you know Oliver. Um, there is uh, Bill Hogan from University of Florida, and we have Asia Lin. And the way uh, this works is we will have uh, first asked the four panelists to prepare a short presentation just on their view on the role of ontologies uh, in biomedical AI. And then we have some discussion uh, aligned with the main aims of this workshop. So I ask, so I think we just do it in uh, alphabetical order, uh, starting, with, starting with Jim. Um, and I have your presentations. Mm, yeah, which one is your? Oh, yep, I got it. So we'll have. Um, should, I, should I stand up? Or? Yes. Yeah. So you can maybe come here and then we'll. I mean, you can either come here or you use this and simply talk and then you need to. Okay. Let me just, um, let me just, however, share this. Um, I'm not actually I'm not sure. Not this sure. Is. Down at the bottom. This one? No, no, down, all the way down. You cannot, what? what? Hmm. Uh -huh. It's not presented? <laughs> no, it's, we, we cannot see the full screen, no. You're sharing the wrong screen. Uh, I am, okay. Um, then, which one do I have to share? Screen two. Screen two? Yeah, okay. Better? Yep, perfect. <laughs> so, so it's a right. Should I use the mic or is it? Is it I think you can use the laptop if you send there. You okay, so I'll just stand mic. here. So I just have a, a few slides of more of an introduction to myself. And, um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm here more sort of an information gathering about ontologies and AI uh, without much experience in, in AI really. But so I, um, have developed a lot of tools for working with ontologies, a lot of software tools, and especially interested in um, it, allowing software to use the full semantics of ontologies like by integrating our reasoners, uh, you know, into various kinds of, of applications. And so, uh, just one example, and I'm giving a talk later this week on, on Wednesday on this thing, Ubergraph, which is a, a RDF triple store online. And, and, with, but particularly is sort of geared towards um, making the semantics of ontologies available to Sparkle in a very convenient way. And so um, there's there are different graphs inside Ubergraph that have different um, deductions like pre-computed. And so just an example, like these are the same set of nodes in each of these, but there's a graph that has sort of all of the possible uh, existential relations is available to you in Sparkle. There's one that's sort of this non-redundant graph. I am kind of interested in different approaches to, to, to creating graphs from ontologies because I think that, you know, as ontologies as they're available to download are more of like source code um, and not necessarily any useful, I mean, they're useful as a graph, but there are maybe like better graphs um, that can be made from them that represent like the, the semantics. And so, um, there we go. Oh, okay. And so, I just wanted to mention that I'm I am involved in this uh, new project of this NSF uh, Harnessing the Data Revolution Institute called Imageomics, um, and so it's this. It's a five-year project uh, with a lot of different universities. Um, and uh, it aims to maybe uh, tackle a lot of the same issues, but in a different area in um, uh, biodiversity informatics. And um, so uh, the idea is to, is to use you know, wildlife images uh, to extract um, novel traits and, and you know, uh, biological data. Um, and so, 
you know, I'm not uh, the leader of it. The, this is led by Tanya Berger Wolf at Ohio State University. Um, there's a number of people here who, are, who kind of have uh, expertise in computer vision and uh, other kinds of machine learning. And so I'm, I'm participating as, as a ontology expert and sort of trying to figure out, you know, how to how to interact with these folks and you know how, what what can ontologies be providing into this uh, into this system here. And so, um, you know, the idea is to have this um, sort of knowledge guided machine learning, so that you know ontologies and other things, you know, current data and all, all sorts of structured databases, you know, feed into uh, the machine learning. Um, inputs and you know, guide the inferences made and then also you know, have this sort of feedback loop also um, back into the into the structure of knowledge. You know, so as a one thing besides ontologies being integrated into the machine learning um, analyses, I'm interested in having like imagenomics outputs be um, sort of you know uh, represented in a fair way where you know when they're describing you know, this picture contains a uh, this picture of a dorsal fin and an eye or whatever that you know have those be um, labeled with ontology terms so that they're all more machine readable. And so then I just wanted to mention there are open positions related to imagenomics. There's uh, we're hiring a postdoc at NC uh, to work in this area, especially from the ontology perspective. And at, at Ohio State, they're right they're right now hiring a machine learning software engineer. And so. Um, we have some other positions so we'll see who writes knowledge graphs. So just want to take this chance in case you have anyone that you know who's looking for positions in this area, please get in touch. Yes, next one. Okay, then just see what I can. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks to it. Yeah, I got my lab also just got a uh, five year grant, new technical grant. We also have an opening for a uh, software developer. Uh, yeah, this uh, oncology focus, uh, but also uh, the domain is vaccine. Yeah, vaccine focus. Yeah. So, if you have any suggestions, I'm going to compete with you. <laughs> <laughs> new positions. <laughs> The screen too. Oh, yeah the screen yeah okay so yeah i have only have a few slides or six slides mm -hmm. so uh yeah like uh, uh rob asking me to give like my view on the roles of oncology on ai so here's my view uh, okay oh yeah there's <laughs> some slide that i got i, I modified from some uh, interesting slide for some other event. So basically, yeah, we do uh, biomedical oncology research. We develop uh, oncology tools, like uh, the so-called oncology animal tools, like uh, oncology bee, oncology focus, oncology rat, uh, some tools you may have used or heard. And also we develop uh, some oncology-based vaccine, knowledge-based, like so-called Viodine. Viodine one was uh, developed uh, 10 years ago, and now we got uh, just got the funding providing two five-year grant. And then we develop uh, some other like oncology-based NLP tools. And um, yeah, so, and then we also develop oncologies. So this is the most recent one is uh, CIDO, it's a coronavirus infection disease. I'm going to give a talk uh, um, Tuesday, Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday. So about oncology. So it's just, uh, it's my major actually. I was born there. Like a study, I was a veterinary medicine uh, major, and then my my graduate school, I had my master's degree in computer science. No, master's degree and the PhD degree, both are in microbiology, immunology. So when the COVID nineteen came, I feel like oh, that is my major. So I was thinking oh, maybe we can do something with oncology. So then we yeah we initiate this work, and then we do the, we do the machine learning. So uh, Edison Ong, some of you may know, like uh, he developed the, the vaccine, the vaccine, ML machine learning. So yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, we use it for COVID-19 vaccine design. So that paper actually has been popular 
uh, has been cited for more than 300 times now in the last couple of years. And uh, you know now what? He is now working as a data scientist uh, in Moderna. So one they make a COVID-19 vaccine. He was initially in G uh, in in G GLK, right? G GSK? No, GSK. GSK. But he didn't like the clinical kind of data analyst uh, work. So he moved to Modella, then he can work on his vaccine design. So it's good for him. So, okay, so uh, we come to the basic idea of ontology, right? And AI. So my, my understanding is like uh, uh, ontology is mainly for the KRR, the so-called on, uh, knowledge uh, representation and the reasoning. So, um, so it's different from uh, machine learning, right? So if you look for the, the wiki, then you can find this page and then it will say, okay, so knowledge orientation, reasoning. So if you look for the, just looking for the, for the content, right? So it's like only a few contents and ontology engineering, basically it's just a major part of the KRR. So that's my first understanding of ontology versus AI. And then I want to give a story about uh, ImageNet. I think probably most of you already know. So the ImageNet, you know, it's, uh, uh, was initiated by Dr. Fei Fei Li. So it's, you know, she is quite famous now, very, very famous uh, a professor in Stanford University. So in, in 2006, right? So he had an idea, she had an idea like, oh, we should do something like ImageNet. So basically collecting maybe thousands or millions now, I don't know, or even more than millions of images. But if you only collect images, it's not enough, right? So you have to know what the image is about. So he somehow, she was lucky. She met with uh, Dr. Phil Bao, right? A creator of WorldNet in Princeton in 2007. So they had a meeting, like a, our meeting, right? So having meetings is very important. So we may have some wonderful discussion together. So they talked about it. And then they say, oh, you know, we should work together. And then they work together. So ImageNet started to use uh, WordNet, so the world's database, and use some of the features to annotate uh, the, the ImageNet data, right? So like if you, if you, to, if you listen to Fei Fei Li's talk, she will say, oh, you know, she had her students or their members so often like working days and night, quickly <laughs> annotate a lot of images. So initially it was painful, but when the image was accumulated to a lot, that is wonderful, very precious resource. And then they had a competition. So they asked uh, you know, the whole world to compete to like uh, uh, develop machine learning tools for the yeah, for the, for, for the like uh, image recognition. So it was a huge success. And then, well, the core part of it is like, they use WordNet. So now WordNet, you know, I would say WordNet is like, a, it's like ontology, right? Maybe it's like the machine learning side of ontology. So they have uh, over 155,000 words organized uh, with uh, some semanticus and the pairs. So it's wonderful, you know, but I don't know, according to our more like a formal ontology so standard, they're not good enough, they're not good enough, but it, you know, it's huge and it has been quite useful. So I just want to bring this use case to see how the ontology like WordNet can really collaborate with more like a data resource like ImageNet and support uh, the machine learning technology. So well, how you can support the machine learning, right? So then you, we have the, they actually they are leading the effort. So they have built up the competition. And uh, so the new one, the convolutional neural network, right? Like the Alicus Net actually became really quite famous because I think it's 2012 or 2015, 2012 probably. So that year, or I don't know, 2008 maybe, but their year actually, their method is more like a tenfold higher, more than tenfold higher uh, performance than the other one. So this is more like a CNN neural network. 
So it's becoming huge, huge successful. Again, so all the things coming down to the end of they use WordNet to annotate their images. So WordNet is so powerful. So that's what I think ontology can support the machine learning very well. So yeah, that's a John, Justin Johnson. Yeah, uh, he actually, if you look for, for YouTube, you say, okay, machine learning tool. So he, he more like, a, he, he was a teacher on like the VPD's course uh, in Stanford, like uh, CNN for, for, vision, for computer visions. So now he's here, he's in the University of Michigan. I actually was lucky to talk to him. We were talking about the potentially initiate some, some collaboration. So he's quite busy uh, this, this year. He, got, he was brought out actually by Facebook. So he said, oh, he only had one uh, every week. Oh, he only had one day, Friday, you know, to work on Michigan thing. But at the time he's working for Facebook now. But anyway, he's a very bright uh, uh, young professor, writing star, do a lot of wonderful work. But again, it's now associated with uh, ImageNet and WordNet. So uh, this is my last slide. So overall, to the point of uh, what's the role of ontology, right, for AI. So this is my view of, uh, of uh, like uh, AI, right? So AI includes at least two parts. I don't know, maybe some other parts. So one is KRR, uh, knowledge orientation and the reasoning. Another one is machine learning. So now the two can be connected together. As example, the by the image net and the word net. So ontology is a major part of KRR. So, so, so what is ontology can do, right? So if you look for the wiki, the KRR, it, it will say, okay, like a beginning, you know, it's very small. It's very small, like early years, it's very small, very fair small. But now, now you know, after bigger data, it's huge. So the huge like data, we cannot no like uh, we cannot do it like in individual labs, right? You we have to work together to yeah. That's why we have the open foundry so popular, right? So we have to develop interoperable ontologies, and then we can provide more richer annotations like what net did right for image net. So what do we do, right? So that's more like the other side. So what do we do in you know, more like a professional ontology community people? So yeah, I don't have a lot to say. I would think uh, most things we already know. So I Rob mentioned that well, we should provide some community initiative. So I fully agree, Rob, I fully agree with you. So we should uh, somehow work together, right? To build up some initiatives, some standards, and then to make data like AI ready. That's what NIH is doing. It's proposing and it has some, some grounds there. Uh, but uh, that's the path, that's the direction. So hopefully in the end, the really ontology and uh, machine learning will work together side by side, together to form a better AI uh, for the future. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Um, let's try. Well, he works on my slides. Um, I'm Bill Hogan. I'm at the University of Florida, uh, where I'm director of biomedical informatics, and I've been working in the area of ontology for about 13, 14, 15 years. Um, and like Oliver, I was asked, uh, what's my view on the role of ontology and AI? And, and also, we were asked, um, uh, what's our experience in this area? So I'm going to tell you about my experience. I interpreted that very loosely um, to go beyond technical scientific experience to sort of more broad political, but still within the context of this scientific domain. So at the University of Florida, we have a cautionary thing. <laughs> We have an AI initiative. It's a university-wide AI initiative. And it was spurred on by the fact that one of the co-founders of NVIDIA is a UF alum, Chris Malachowski. And so Malachowski made a big donation and NVIDIA made a big donation. They gave us a DGX SuperPod. So that's a lot of fun to play with, especially if you have exclusive access to it for a week to build 
a large language model from clinical notes, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Uh, we're also building a building where our department's supposed to go. So that's kind of exciting. That's the building under construction. I snapped that from the live camera this morning. So that's the building as of about 8 a.m. today. Well, we're supposed to move in in uh, May or so next year. So why, what is the goal? What is the Uber purpose of the AI initiative? It's to enable any student at UF in any discipline, right? Any discipline, English, social work, besides chemistry, physics, math, right? To enhance their education with an AI component. Um, and so then they said, well, we're gonna need more AI experts. So we're gonna hire a hundred AI experts to the University of Florida faculty, okay? So in the health science colleges, we got, you know, we're six colleges, we got out of 16, we got 31 of these uh, faculty lines. And we had a very unusual search committee structure. We had three thematic search co committees with membership spanning the six health science colleges and multiple departments in each college. So if you're hiring AI experts, you know, maybe you're a little light to begin with. So we have non-AI experts serving on these search committees, right? So the non-AI expert has a very warped view of AI, but ontology is not AI. The candidate is not qualified. And so an AI expert chairing an AI faculty search committee says, no, you're wrong. Ontology is AI. Not all AI is machine learning. But this non-expert was adamant. No, I am right and you are wrong. Now, what do you do with that? Ontology overlaps biomedical AI. Ontology is broader than just biomedical, right? So this is very similar to what Oliver presented. Biomedical ontology is a <laughs> biomedical AI. Against AI myopia, it is not the case that we should equate all of biomedical AI with biomedical applications of deep learning. But that is the view of our senior VP, deans, search committee members who aren't AI experts. And so we have to counter that. It's a cautionary tale. No, no, absolutely not. Stop it, right? And I know you know these things, but the, 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 you need to be aware of the perception that counters what you know to be true. And we have to advocate for ourselves. And so the hype and enthusiasm, we used to be the golden children in ontology, right? Well, now the deep learners are the golden childs. And um, the ontology is starting to take a back seat. And Nasia mentioned that in her presentation. So we have to be careful as a community counter and not reinforce the idea that only ML is AI. Um, so then I said, okay, well now I'll go answer what he was really asking. <laughs> um, so uh, prior knowledge or injecting knowledge, right? That we saw a lot of that in today, today's presentations, uh, but also enhancing data is the key substrate for ML. So this is, you know, old reliable, um, standardizing, integrating, enriching data. That's what ontologies were, do and are built for. Uh, but also this idea of making data, I would say let's make data ML ready, not, you know, it may be AI ready more broadly, but again, if you say we're making data AI ready, but you're really making it ML ready, then you're reinforcing the perception that ML is equivalent to all of AI, right? Analytic data sets, there's lots of counting and roll-ups. How many antihypertensives is a patient taking from a list of prescriptions of very detailed drugs? How many outpatient visits did they have? You know, so counting outpatient visits of, and making a new variable out of that. Uh, we can do, a, you know, ontology can help with, with a lot of those kinds of queries and roll-ups, as we call them. Um, and then, you know, the whole idea of um, representing data and software and probably even machine learning models to improve their fairness. And that's not a complete list. Uh, it may not be a complete list. It wasn't intended. So prior knowledge, you know, this community has been doing it. So here's Robert in a paper from October of 2020. 
Um, injecting knowledge is a term I hadn't heard before, but I think it's cool. So the first workshop on injection, knowledge injection and neural networks, October of last year. Uh, and this is from the conference summary with some emphasis added, combine purely data-driven learning with an infusion of knowledge from external sources. That's what we've been discussing. So ontologies are one type of AI. Ontologies play important roles in other types of AI like machine learning and prior knowledge is showing some promise like we've heard and has been published as a way of improving machine learning. That's it. Okay, and then we have the last, uh, as the last uh, center as here, um, before we go to the discussion part. Just a second. Which one is it? This one. Okay. Just. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I still need the mic. Yes. All right. So um, I actually, I think all, all I'm going to talk about is very like complementary to all the previous speakers, what they're talking about. And my view has been presented for my previous talk, but I really experienced some things that from my work. So I used to work at the FDA and we do those review, review the submission and the way that I review the data is from our researchers point of view is ridiculous. I will show you how, and then it will give you some inspiration, but this ridiculous, it's, it's not like, I'm not saying negatively, it's like the need for how they need to make a, a decision because their decision is very big. They have to protect the health, the public health. Of course, sometimes there's pressure, political pressure as well. Okay, so learn how we failed and will we'll help us to learn how to use success. All right, let's continue saying that, oh, goal used to be a golden child. And then now everything goes to AI and machine learning. So why people are so hesitant to invest money into ontology? Uh, by the way, it's not that they are very hesitant. The disease ontology group just got uh, how many million? Two million for five years. So you all say that I got a, a fund for five years. I want to ask you, is five years enough for your machine learning artificial intelligence? It's not. So, so, so for Go, it has been invested 20 years since 2001. And the uh, add together, my, this number may not be correct because I just look at the reporter, reporter that the NIH has this uh, transparency of how they fund money. So for 20 years, they were they're having 60, almost $68 million, which means they spend about three millions for a year develop their gene ontology. And there in this paper, this paper, Bill is part of it, right? This was written 10 years ago. So if you do a calculation, I wanted to do like, I can search all those numbers put together, but I didn't have time. Uh, I can do it later. So if you look at all this, you will see they actually NIH or uh, NSF put a lot of money into ontologies, but Ontologies is not enough what we have now. That's why. All right. So gene ontology has a lot of success. If we are counting it using the published paper, it now has 33,000 papers mentioning about the gene ontology and a, uh, in their publication. So it's a golden, also a great example for how ontology is being successful. But the problem is we only have gene ontology. This one is from my previous slide. We only see gene ontology uh, flourishing there. And I, was, I want to ask you as a community, why is that? We have to find the reason why. And then we can, 
we can make it blooming, the, the oncology development. Okay. And then I observed something that is very worrisome. I am involved in a group who is building a rare disease knowledge graph, and they were getting data from different sources. So the knowledge graph, if they build very superficially, you create a lot, in the future, it will create a lot of false negative that will be not useful. For example, for this, this figure, this is a, a clinical trial. And then it links to agonesia is a kind of a condition. It's also linked to a rare disease. However, when we look at the clinical trial data, agonesia is not the condition mentioned in that clinical trial. So we look into it, why is that? It's just some annotation tool. The real, the real condition mentioned there is, oh, this is not clear, I'm sorry. Is, um, yes, this one. Ag Agonesias. Yes, because I think they have a text menu tool and those two words are very similar. That's why it gets there. So you, you really need to be cautious about how your knowledge graph was built, and then you can have a better result. And then also, while I'm doing those literature review, I observed something which I think is a little bit worrisome. For example, if we are making an assumption, um, this paper says if the child, if the parent term has some sort of relationship, then each child term of these two will hold a possible relationship. I think this relationship is highly false negative, false positive, I'm sorry. It's highly possible. And the, the red, the red uh, line I pointed there, I think make a little bit more sense, but we still, we do not know still because biological is so complex, such a complex uh, system. And uh, very, and, Jobs, they will talk about it during the conference on their opinion on AlphaGo. So it will be a very interesting talk to hear why they are thinking the machine will not win the world. And another one is these two papers, they also talk about, okay, if, uh, if any annotations, uh, in all the annotations, uh, okay, they identify the true path graph. So if a child term is annotated positive, then their parent term is also annotated positive. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand what does it mean, but maybe they are right, but maybe they're wrong too. And then the, the, if the parent is negative, then child term is certainly negative. I think this is talking about the true path, but I don't know what that means true path. Is it mathematical or semantic? I, I, I don't know. And this one is talking about, uh, we are going to calculate the annotations of a child term by adding all their ancestors' annotations. What does that add to? I, and we know that annotations maybe is, we are lacking a lot of annotation. So I, I, I will be very, very, careful about this one too. So, so let me tell you a few, few examples that I experienced since 2009. So 2009, I just graduated from my PhD in Japan and I work at Recon. I was in a sequencing lab. I was excitedly telling my PI, I said, okay, this is what I do, ontology. So if we found A linked to B and B linked to C, we can make an inference a to C, but he immediately told me, no, 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 no. This is very, very dangerous because A to B and B to C, you, 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 can, you can make it extremely wrong from make this kind of assumption. So this word stick me until today. Um, and then 2016, I was working at the FDA and we we're discussing about using neural network to find the adverse event from the adverse event reports that sent to FDA. And the requirement from leadership is that we need to have accuracy of 99% of 
0.99 percentage. And me and my friend were like, this is not possible. The best is like 80% or something. So I don't know, I didn't follow this one. I don't know what they did with that, that project. But certainly the machine learning is heavily needed in those kinds of things. And then in 2018, we did an ontology supported NLP pilot was failed from the leadership's eye because they say your performance like precision and recall is about 70%. That's too bad. We're not going to invest anymore. So and all those, the PhD students, you also lost the interest. So we failed. And then uh, we have another in 2020 when COVID started, a group of FDAs, AI machine learning experts, they are doing a drug repurposing project, but they they emphasize that we have a component that is experimental validation. That's how they got the funding for this project and got a lot of support. And now um, after, during pandemic, we know that we have a lot of things to do with AI ethics problems, uh, equity problems with AI. So NH actually initiated a lot of programs like NHEAD and the Bridge to AI to help to address those uh, issues. So I'm going to just mention a little bit about uh, Bridge to AI, Bridge to AI made for standardized data attributes, develop automated tools, especially emphasize the ethical best practice and to promote the diverse teams. So this Bridge to AI program is just awarded amongst all the centers who are awarded. Um, you should expect data coming from this project, this program in two or three years, maybe. See if it's good to use for the machine learning, if it improves. Well, we have, I, so the big data is coming, but we might not need big data, but big data is still coming. Uh, we, I think we will really need the semantically meaningful and accurate data, whether small or big, but those mm -hmm. things is essential. And so to end that, we, we have a saying, say, let us thousand flowers bloom, actually it's from Mao, Chairman Mao. He's saying, let 100 flowers bloom and then let uh, 100 academic schools to just, anyway, we should do whatever we can do and uh, we should not compete. We should uh, collaborate and we should generate a lot of creative ideas and to be inclusive. Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody's contribution is, uh, how do I say, is less. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have prepared a few questions just uh, to start the discussion. And I will address um, these questions first to our panelists, but I, um, please, all these questions are intended for the whole audience. So it should not be just the discussion for the panel. Um, I think, uh, I hope the panel will, just a second, I, it's coming as soon as I figure out how, how all of this works. Um, and um, so we'll start with the panel, but in the end, um, in the end, um, please, all of you um, are very welcome to join this discussion. Coming, coming. Yes, so some of these questions we have already addressed and you have already addressed in, um, in, in your presentations and we have discussed before, but um, I have, I think I have only six questions. So maybe we'll start with the first one. 
And this is uh, just to reiterate, I have seen a number of different views by the four of you, and maybe you have some additional views. So um, I think the key um, role that ontologies play, that all everybody so far has agreed, is that ontologies are there to integrate and provide high quality data for machine learning models. And I think this was mentioned throughout these discussions in more, many of your talks. This is something that I think all of uh, everybody can agree. And I think this is the main role. There are ways to query data and prepare the state. But um, then, and this is a big question. So we have from ontologies are better graphs. So essentially for, for, for Jim uh, to ontologies may hold the key to some grand challenge for biomedical AI or biomedical machine learning um, that, that Oliver mentioned. So there's a very broad range. So maybe we can uh, I asked this question first uh, to you. So what is this role uh, of ontologies in biomedical AI and in particular, um, and it's AI, not just machine learning. So this is absolutely true. Um, um, also uh, mm, mm, what you have said, but is it primarily about preparing and integrating data or is there something more that ont ontologies can provide um, in, in AI, in biomedical AI. You want to ask Steve? <laughs> you okay. want to? Okay. I, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think uh, definitely is the answer definitely is not only, right? It's not only the data uh, preparation. So the semantics uh, that the ontology provide is great, right? As uh, Ava uh, should also recognize. And also I want to see one thing. Uh, in addition to semanticals. So ontology uh, provide uh, more like a knowledge base, right? So it's uh, more like a background. So when you talk about, uh, you know, something like, or if when we say, oh, you are human, you are, you are monkey, <laughs> you are plant. So you all know what it means, but uh, machine can not know, right? So, but when we put, uh, when we code those uh, definitions into ontology format, and the machine knows. So when we say, oh, you are plant, you are monkey, you are animals, they all know the answers. So the background behind ontology, ontology, like a COVID background, is a huge. And I don't know uh, if current uh, machine learning system has fully used uh, the, the background built up by ontology. So on the sense. Yeah, I think I, I see a lot of people in the article, they say ontology provides context for their data for machine learning. That is one. Of course, it's more. And then um, I was mentioning about the neural symbolic network is really, it's really a very good direction because they added the constraints of ontology into your data preparation and as well as methodology. So yeah, that is what I can say right now. Um, yeah, I, I think one way that ontologies can provide a better background is maybe through testing uh, outputs of, uh, of AI methods that maybe output as some kind of uh, instance model like in the terms of an ontology, and um, and then checking whether that you know the model they generate is consistent with the, all the background logic that's in the ontology. Um, one one issue I, I'm talking with some of the folks like in the, in the genomics group, um, it, I, maybe there has to be a really good match between the, how the ontology was developed and what's being analyzed because uh, they've been sort of segmenting some images of uh, fish specimens and. We we're trying to apply uh, some of the semantics that can be brought into that. But then in practice, there really wasn't that much that, um, to be you know, contradicted. Maybe it's the results they had. So maybe uh, it's a little bit of a bad fit. So I'm, but I am kind of interested in how that could work in general. Well, maybe we have uh, from the audience. Yeah, I was wondering if somebody could give an example of a ML preparation step that that an ontology would would guide um, 
integrating makes sense to me. So if you have uh, data from different sources, uh, this drugs may be referred to by different names or phenotypes or, or, or whatever. So, so you can normalize things across sources. Bill gave the good example of roll-ups that, which also this is kind of an integration and normalization stuff. But what, what are some of the other ways that ontology guides ML preparation? So this may be a question to, uh, to, to somebody. I can see. Yeah, yeah I think for the image, yeah, yes, as far as I know, um, well, actually there are two levels, right? So one level is more like, a, I don't know, yeah, image net, right? So, so basically just uh, use word net uh, uh, words to standardize data. So, and then, you know, after standardization, uh, of course, uh, so in, so what net has the semanticus right? Have relations among the words. So I would think uh, they may also be used. But actually, it reminds me also something like traditionally, like a, like a measure, right? It's, it's fine. Use a lot for measure for like it was event analysis. So you can see like the in measure world, they always use the measure code for. Like standardization, like, like, uh, there is no certain FDA is drug reporting certain, but they don't usually use those IDs for like a semantic for classification, right? So often when I develop with my ontology, but it was events, I would say, oh, we have one advantage than them because we can use semanticus, so we can classify them, we can show that relations. So I would think uh, the traditional way is more like a, Mainly use it for standardization. So stick with the code. I don't care about definition. I hope everyone knows the definition automatically. But the newer nowadays is more like you, you want to use the semantics more. The problem is how to do it, right? What tools we can use, how we can better develop the semantics so so AIs can be more beneficial. Let's put on it. I I remember so actually. So there, there are ontology can create a very flexible way to do the classification of the terms because different groups seeing groups seeing classes seeing the defined classes very differently, like a psychologist or FDA uh, reviewers. They want a different kind of uh, classification of the of the terminology that they have. But then every time there's a new class coming up, they have to go through a very long-term, long, -term, long uh, process to add those class in. I give you an example for breast implant because I was doing that. My ontology-based NLP field is breast implant related. So breast implant, in the beginning, I believe it has code. They, they coded based on the breast implants uh, theory. So breast implant has a saline fill and a silicone fill. That is what FDA has the code coded to. And then after some time, people found out there is a cancer related to breast implant, maybe related with the uh, surface of the breast implant, either smooth or uh, either texture, texture surface. So if you notice the nose, it news, there are a lot of news about breast implant, right? There are some breast implant brand just got recalled from the market. So then there is at FDA, and then at FDA, we, we don't have this class. And then it, it takes us forever to add this new class into the FDA codes, product codes. Uh, that's why we have ontology to, to, to classify it as textured or smooth. And then, because this question is, there is no conclusion to this question. And then after EU, right after UK left EU, because there is a class terminology system called the Global Nomenclature for Medical Device. Uh, it's, it's maintained by a group in UK. After UK moved out from EU, and then EU have another group based in Italy. They say, we want to classify breast implant by their shape because the shape also has something to do 
And then they will discuss when we have this classification. Yeah, Italy, EU has this classification, UK has that. I said, this is easy for my ontology. I just add a new class, say a uh, shaped class. But the point is, my data has to have those features in my ontology. Did you get what I mean? I hope. I mean, I, what I heard was some interesting discussion about ontology development. I, I, I didn't hear how that would be a guide for a machine learning process. Well, yeah, so the classification of the, how do you use the input? The classification label, the data is, is, is the input data, right? One, one kind of way of using data is to use uh, ontology category the data. I train the data with those labor labels, and then I output the my real data with indicated with predicted labels. Those labels are usually ontology terms. So different groups will have different ways to look at the same stuff with different labels, and to create those labels for our terminology or system are very cumbersome, but if you have an ontology to create those uh, defined classes, it is really flexible. So that is. Okay, let, uh, let us maybe move to Sivaram. He had a question for a very, or a comment for a very long time. Um, let's move uh, maybe on. I have one comment. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I have one comment, then I will also take into this comment, a question on this one. So, with Bill's uh, presentation, I agree with everything he said, except for one thing, which where he said ontology, how do we take, uh, you know, is a buzzword or something like that. And mm. or some, you had <laughs> one slide which said something. Anyway, it's okay. So you've been talking in the ontology community, right? This is a small community. We have been saying, you know, with ontology can do this, and ontology can do that. And, you know, with, with ontology, you can do all these X, Y, Z things. So. When it comes to this question, our ontology is just about integrating and preparing data for machine learning. Has anyone shown proof of that? Or is this like a, a faith-based thing? It should be better kind of a thing. Has anybody shown that the same, taking the same data set uh, with and without on, using ontology-based normalization, uh, it actually results in much better results. Mm -hmm. I just make a comment. Uh, maybe if you need. Okay, I'll remove my mic. Yeah, just make a comment about stuff. Um, from my experience, right, it's about the string and the machine not knowing what that string means. Right? So, in a column of strings, it doesn't know what it is. And the ontology informs that. So, if I have, let's say, uh, water in a drug. It doesn't know what it's a drug. So it, when you connect it to an ontology class called drug, then the machine knows it's a drug, right? That's entity recognition case. So it's more than, so I would say it's not just the ontology, but also the, the strings, the taxonomies that tie to the ontologies that adds that value, okay? That helps in integration and preparing data for machine learning. I think that's, and that's what most of. Um, unfortunately, I've been given that same talk for over 10 years. <laughs> I've been guilty of that very same thing. Now I'm questioning myself in saying that, yeah, I keep saying this, but what's the proof? Somebody asks me, what's the proof for that? Yeah, there are some papers I read that they, they, they had those kind of comparison, but you have to look at how they evaluate the result, right? That's why it's my next. So what I'm saying is that there are some papers they did say that. Chris, can you say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, so, so they said that, yes, we perform better than without ontology, but I also see some people saying that We'd rather use traditional classifier, but then you have to see how they do their 
performance evaluation, what methodology, what parameters. That's why I want to do for my literature review, I, I want to do the deeper dive for those things. <coughs> Rob? Yes. Uh, we have two, two points, one from uh, 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 Lauren uh, uh, raised, and maybe we should give some some chance for people online to talk. And and um, we have another uh, point for Hilmar. Yes, so this is true. I had Hilmar's uh, comment in mind. There is another one, which is uh, where Lauren. was the other one? I think it's Hilmar's comment. So there uh, is a comment by Hilmar uh, Lapp, and he is asking the question of we are only considering on using ontologies as inducing background knowledge in some machine learning models but are we also considering where the goal of a machine learning model is to produce knowledge in a structured form ideally in the form of an ontology is this something that is also useful to so produce formalized knowledge by a machine learning model so i think this is the question um, and and there's a question and, and an opinion. I think I think it's uh, something to discuss. And Lauren also, who's joining us over Zoom, has has a, a question, but she's raised her hand. It's not written down. Okay, so maybe I put Hilmar's comment first to the panel. And then we go to Lauren. Then we have one last question, and then we move to the next uh, panel question. No, so. uh, it's a great comment. I'm glad you made it. Um, I. I I'm going to claim I have that thought, but I can't prove it because I didn't write it down. So, um, uh, but but I am a co-author on a review article of building ontologies from NLP. So, um, and 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 it, I, it could be a virtuous cycle, right? It's the machine learning discovers new associations that's captured in the ontology that send plug back into new machine learning applications, and um, you know that's. Um, one of the wraps I've always kind of had against uh, machine learning is to learn a model once and then throw it out there and one will never do anything with it again. And then, um, you know, through Google flu trends, we know that reality changes out from under the model and then the model goes to hell. I mean, you have to keep the model current, you have to fresh it. Machine learning isn't learning, is not how humans learn. Um, we, we constantly incorporate what we know into future learnings. and. and it's cumulative and we build, whereas these models don't really ever build on each other or have any kind of cumulative incorporation of what you learn into your next analysis. So that's my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Um, one, okay, let me take this. So I think we have, um, so let's move to Chris Mungle, who was waiting for a long time, then to Lauren. Uh, online, and then we have one more question, and then we move to the next panel question. Please, Chris. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to go back to this idea of ontology is not just providing the data, but providing the background prior knowledge um, that can help inform these AI ML algorithms. And you know, I'm very heartened to hear about you know new neurosymbolic learning methods, but it seems these are still kind of like in the in the minority. And yeah, you know, I'm very happy Bill was kind of flying the kind of good old-fashioned AI flag. I wonder what you know, and also when I see a lot of these ML people using ontologies, they use them in a very kind of simplistic way where they kind of throw out a lot of the work that we put into these ontologies. What what do the panel think are good ways to kind of like help bridge that gap between this kind of like you know newer ML community, help them to better understand ontologies, how they could be used? Is there other kind of funding mechanisms or kind of educational approaches that you can take to, to help really, you know, educate people in ontology such that they make better use of I can try first. I think that you made a very good point. So, because uh, first of all, we come for discussions, you know, like we try to defend the something so that we have been trying for years, right? So we're trying to open some new initiative or new area of thinking. Maybe we can provide uh, some guidance, you know, for the future or for non-ontology people or AI or machine learning people. So I think one 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 sort of one thinking I, I can feel like from like Mark uh, and uh, Sigurd and Chris is more like uh, 
Oh, really, we have been talking for over year, two years, right? But we were convinced how ontology can really support the, like uh, machine learning in, in a big way. Or like, uh, well, you don't have to think too hard. It's just there, right? So uh, I think that's, that's a big question, actually. I think we have our reasons, but maybe it's like so-so. Uh, so the question actually comes to what the real, what Chris just, talk, just mentioned. How can we do better? How can we do it more like it's more like fact that people can see the obvious. It's not like you have seen that too hard. So I think the probably just what our ontology people can do, right? For example, just give one sort, right? So it's more like uh, for future mission, right? So we're trying to defend ourselves. So for example, can we see, okay, I know relation ontology is great, right? So probably we should better use the relation ontology. And uh, can we say, oh, you know, just give, we don't have to be very big. Can we just give maybe 10 most powerful relations and build on the 10 relations? And now we can already, like, uh, the two relations will, will basically bind things around. But then it's already hugely improved AI or machine learning. This is something maybe is doable. It's just some quick thought. Yeah, actually, I think I talked too much, but. Actually, I um, I see that in my paper I reviewed, a lot of they are using ESR relation, the hierarchical relation. They are not really, I think machine learning community didn't catch up with ontology mm -hmm. because we are building very complex system. And they have to have some method to really take advantage of that. How do you numeric, make the number of ESR and the part of, or any others? I also, thought about that, like what all the thought. I think we should just uh, define very simple relations and then compute and try challenge on that and then see what's, what's the effect. Okay, I think, uh, George, we have one more question online. Is that correct? That is correct from Lauren. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I had a couple things to say. So the first thing I want to say is, um, there was a, a comment that that someone made. I don't know who it was. Forgive me. They said um, that like AI, uh, it doesn't learn the same way that a person learns, and doesn't necessarily incorporate like new knowledge, um, at least not in the same way. And that's um, that's a really good point. And so I kind of thought um, in the future of ontology, um, that could be a, another potential role for ontologies is to continuously integrate what is learned from whatever the what, whatever the machine learning application is. Um, I, I mean, currently what I think about is like, okay, well, ontologies when they're updated are, it's very laborious to update an ontology and, um, you know, create new definitions and, and all of this stuff. Um, so, you know, we are still in the infant stages of even being able to make a coherent ontology. Like we, we, we can use like AI for doing like annotations and things like that. I, I feel like there's a lot of work in that area, um, but it's interesting to think about, okay, can we use an ontology to one, derive new knowledge via AI and then feedback and then incorporate that new knowledge into the ontology that sort of underlies that AI. Um, but it's, you know, to think about like doing that in an automated fashion is, that's a lot. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, so actually uh, someone else brought up a very good point. Um, like you kind of hear this, this, um, this uh, idea repeated that like, oh, ontologies are, are useful for integrating and preparing data and, and making it easier to work with for all sorts of applications. Um, but it's actually true that there's there's not a lot of empirical evidence to, to support that that claim. Um, um, actually, that's one of the impetuses, impeti for <laughs> what my my PhD project has turned into um, is uh, to make a long story short, trying to actually determine if um, implementing an ontology, a an onto a VFO based uh, ontology changes the results of um, I'm I'm doing logistic regression 
um, which is fairly simple to implement. But I'm implementing um, ontologies and terminologies under different conditions to essentially try and see uh, what actually is it that makes a difference uh, in the outcomes of these uh, machine learning and other kinds of AI analyses, and if there even is a difference. So I think that that what you said is extremely important, um, whoever brought that up, because there's not really a substantial body of literature. There's like one pretty interesting paper that I found from like 2008 that looks at the go and basically finds, um, you know, when you implement the gene ontology, um, as part of data analysis, it does affect statistical results in different ways. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of work since that or any work really following that up. But I think that that's an interesting finding that even though it's just one finding, it does support this idea of it is it is worth it to use ontologies in as as a part of the data analysis preparation process. But we we do need to do more mm -hmm. because if we want this field to be scientific, um, it's very important. So we really can't keep just kind of parroting this assumption. Um, anyway, that, that was what I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, maybe a very brief response for the last response for this question uh, from the panel, if somebody... Uh, so um, just to... Uh, Go back a couple questions to answer Chris, Chris, Chris's question, and I think it also speaks to my question. Is, um, it's a two-way street. I've got to learn about machine learning. And if we want to know what ontologies can do for machine learning, we should also ask the machine learners and say, what 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 problems do you have? And try to understand them and maybe learn them to find new ways to ontology play around. Okay. Thank you very much. So I think we have only half an hour left. Um, let's move on. I'm sorry for, I, I know there are, and for those of you online, there are many more questions or um, from the audience, but let's move on and move this, um, move this on. So my question too is, I think something that I'm going to skip this second question, which is which aspects of AI would benefit from ontologies and how, I think we have discussed this as part of the first question. We don't need this. Um, and where are examples? Uh, where this helped. This is, I think, the uh, question that has been asked many times and not uh, not comprehensively answered yet. So, and here, this is the third question is really a question about the grand challenge that can only be answered uh, if we were to combine machine learning and ontologies. And I think uh, Oliver was trying to outline this in the beginning. Um, in a summary, a, a challenge like this. So what would be a grand challenge that requires ontologies and machine learning? Uh, here's a suggestion on trustworthiness and interpretability, but I kind of wonder if somebody else has a grand challenge that really would benefit, something that would have a tremendous impact if it were to succeed that would likely require ontologies and machine learning combined. If not, we're going to skip it and go to the next question. I don't know if it answered your question, but um, just a second before, if please, uh, I just this is just some experience. Okay? So, in in the industry uh, where we're trying to integrate a lot of unstructured data and structured data, if there's a lot of harmonizing to be done. You know, standardizing stuff. You extract stuff and you standardize it, and that's where I see it's a huge challenge. <laughs> it's uh, to get the best uh, uh, entity level information harmonized mm -hmm. is the big challenge. And if you mm -hmm. have done that, then you have huge graphs that you can run. AI yes. I think, and because you have that framework, which is in your ontology, you know, all the the biology knowledge the relationships, mm -hmm. the natural language relationships, mm -hmm. the predicates that are then utilized for many of the downstream applications, mm -hmm. like, you know, chatbots and all of that is run off of that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right in the middle of that kind of a cha challenge mm -hmm. where day in and day out, I'm trying to 
harmonize all my strings. And of course, I don't, uh, I, I use all of the ontology in BioPortal. And of course, I use UMLS a lot. Yes. Okay, because it's, it's one resource that accommodates over 100 vocabularies. Yes. And so all terms that are extracted go through that huge index and then, then classifies them through some classes, which they, of course, call as semantic types. Nonetheless, at least everything is classified and it solves much of the challenge at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of data already coded with your analysis. Yes, exactly. So, so like, we have. So, I just reminded of the grand challenge, and it's outside my area of expertise. So I'm going out on the limb to do this too by uh, I was reminded of this problem where a patient would be identified as having what should have been a lethal mutation, but they're living, walking, talking, just perfectly healthy. So, they had something protective. And we don't know what the protective thing is. Uh, if we could work as uh, two communities together, ontology and machine learning, uh, to identify what are the protective factors and a generic, general, maybe it's again, I'm really reaching uh, a, a general approach to find the hidden factors or hidden um, variations that are protective oh. against lethal ones. Maybe that's a great challenge. Yeah, I want to give one, one more comment. So in, in uh, AI or machine learning field, people will say, right, uh, personality, you know, AI will never replace human or, or uh, machine learning can never beat a human, right? So because one reason is, or uh, because they don't know each other, they can only be narrowly down into the small data set. And it's more like the, actually the island, right? They cannot go out of it. You can only do these things. But actually I was thinking about this for a long time. I said, oh, you know what? Actually, ontology can can be, can can be the gap, right? Can can fill the gap because if you have individual things, machine learning can do, and people say, oh, those are only individual because the AI cannot jump. Well, if you put the ontology, you make the AI jumping against each other, jumping from one to another one, put the context there, put the background there. So then, actually, AI will be smarter. AI may just be the human. So, but anyway, that's uh, very bad, right? If AI really be the human, but that, that is uh, the logic behind. I mean, I do remember a grand challenge by um, Kitano, mm -hmm. who put out this grand challenge for an AI to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology mm -hmm. by 2050. Mm -hmm. So I think that was his challenge to build um, an automated system that does win the Nobel Prize and also gives the award speech. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's like a grand challenge. It's not my work at all, but isn't uh, like the ontology in the cell this automated pipelines for like taking a whole whole piles of cells, figuring out what proteins they're expressing, generating a like random forest of how we would define this thing, pruning it until you have an ontological definition, putting it into the division of cell ontology, and using that to reason over all these cell types, like high throughput classification, combining it's like I don't know, AI stuff, they make it sound all fancy, but this is just like clustering. Random forest filtering, and then you end up with uh, an interesting, like, ontology artifact at the end that has an actual explicitly encoded knowledge instead of just a gigantic matrix of numbers that you don't understand. So, I don't know. Uh, other people in this room probably know that project more than me, but that's really interesting combination of what I think of as an ally ontology. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. I like that, and it just made me think that. Um, you know, there was a, there was a re revolution in taxonomy when people realized that molecular markers were a better way for uh, differentiating uh, species than, than visible phenotypes. But we stuck with the same number and rank and names for the, for the ranks in a taxonomy. And it would be really interesting to look through traits of organisms. They could be purely, purely molecular. 
molecular and propose a new taxonomy and say, what are the number of ranks you need to uh, differentiate organisms? And would we find, you know, like, would we find that there's actually a different number of, of domains from eukaryotes, prokaryotes, and archaea? Um, so that would be machine learning over a huge number of genomes and ont ontological representation of um, the organisms themselves. So I'm just gonna, I was just going to mention that Hilmar, who was, uh, spoke earlier, has worked on an ontology-based clade definition mm -hmm. language. I don't know if you have anything to, to say about that. So, yeah, so I have, I have one more idea as a possible grand challenge would be um, unraveling the uh, effects and contributions that the environment has on human disease and uh, disease outcomes. So that's a that's currently a massive challenge right now because genes are only estimated to contribute to about five to ten percent of diseases. Um, the rest presumably coming from the environment and um, as we currently know, the environment is massive in its scope. It includes things from the built environment, um, you know, the buildings and architecture that people find themselves associated with, uh, the social circumstances that people find themselves in, um, as well as various things that they come in contact with. Um, there's a lot of data out there on that um, from probably hundreds, if not thousands of different communities that needs to be integrated. And uh, there's obviously going to be a role that machine learning will play in studying that stuff. Um, so we just need to actually start building links to data sets that can enable that. Um, so I think that that's one area that uh, both machine learning and ontologies will play a role mm -hmm. in the near future, hopefully. I mean, just now, probably. Not the future. OK, uh, so I think. Uh, with this, let's move to the next question because we have uh, three questions left. I'm going to merge the next two questions. So the next two questions are essentially uh, two questions, and it's a question of what can we do to, as ontologists, in our domain to have more impact or to contribute uh, to the uh, AI or the revolution that AI methods, all kind of different AI methods have in biomedicine and in biology. So what would have to change in ontologies? So how can we make them more useful? And my next question is, um, so I will merge these two questions just because we are short on time. It's what can we do as ontologists to make our ontologies more useful? And what kind of missing methods or tools would we have to develop to contribute better or uh, more to machine learning or the impact it has as ontologists? Maybe we start with, because you have been, yes, I have been ignoring you for a very long time. So I, maybe I start with output, not the panel. No, no please. Okay. Um, actually, uh, my question I had before kind of relate also to this question. So I thought it would. Um, I'm not an apologist. I apologize. I'm in this, I'm a foreigner in this meeting. But um, I've been using ontology in different biomedical domains. <coughs> Um, but I'm confused about the concept, and it, maybe it helps to understand what these questions are about. There's ontologies in my mind mostly about hierarchical definition, is a relationship or plural. Um, but then we often throw ontologies into the same bucket as classification or as knowledge graphs. So, what are the differences really? And is maybe the future of ontology in more complex, more um, more broader, not just up and down hierarchical relations, but you know, more pro properties on each relation. Sure. Yeah, I can. Okay. So yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. So that's uh, what I was uh, mentioning. Oh, we probably should uh, look for more relations, right? Maybe we should look for ten relations. Can most powerful relations that can be used to support the machine learning. So like ESA, of course, if ESA is the most powerful, so we should use ESA. But there are many others, like a part of or you know, many others. 
So uh, that's one thing. So another thing is, uh, yeah, to the question, I would feel like, again, maybe, you know, it's more like a lot of people actually, they are more like machine learning field, right? They, they develop their own society for, for doing machine learning. But I feel like uh, maybe one thing, I know like a robot actually has done a great job over the last many years. So maybe we should uh, kind of more like uh, from our ontology side, right? We should do something, maybe do something together, right? Like uh, maybe have some initiative. I think, uh, yeah, this is uh, more like uh, the meeting, the roadie meeting, the good one, maybe to start with. So it's like uh, maybe our ontology uh, community, right? It's a community. Well, I, I would assume we are representing uh, a, a bigger community of ontology. Maybe we can together propose some more like uh, ideas, suggestions. Mm -hmm. No, then to our audience is not only us, it's more like also for the machine learning, the other side of the island. But again, I, we will think that, right, like ontology and the machine learning, they are all part of AI and we can help each other. Um, how about first you? So, I mean, I, I like this question. I, I think we're asking it to the wrong people. Yes. I think we need to ask it to the machine learning people. You know, we're, we're talking about they're only using the is a or the part of, or they're only using it as, as a classification. We we have built this. Why haven't they come? Well, why haven't they come? I, I think we need to reach out to them as opposed to them reaching out to us. And so I for this specific question, I, I think we need to reach out to, to the machine learning community of AI community and ask them what what do they need from the ontologies? Yeah, I can add um, what you were saying because I was just trying to say the same thing. Can you turn it on, please? Uh, I think uh, we as ontologists should because all the machine learning always say we don't have we don't have good training data sets, right? Yeah. It's lack of training data sets, blah blah blah. So we should create data sets and a golden standard result. And then go to the machine learning community, tell them that we want you to create methods and to see which one is the highest performance. I think that's that is our like collaborative idea. Chris, yeah, I, I, I agree with all this, and I think it's it's great we should kind of like it expand more usage of relational ontology and use these additional relations. We should definitely go to the machine learners, learners and engage with them more. But you know, I think we have to go a bit beyond that. I think a lot of the machine learning people don't even have a sense of what's possible. And also it has to be a three-way conversation as well with the actual you know, need use cases here. Like we're not just about boosting 2% on some kind of like yes. you know, leaderboard or something like that. So you know, maybe some kind of concrete examples here would be you know, in ontology, I helped develop Uberon, as well as just there's a relationships and part of relationships. We've got really deep spatial knowledge about how things are connected or not connected or cannot be connected with one another. Yes. Um, within the gene ontology, we've got a rich knowledge about biological pathways. And again, it's not just like is there relationships, it's like temporal relationships, like this step precedes this step mm -hmm. for this reaction to occur. We need this class of chemical entities, you know, but maybe there's actually a chemical reasoning you can do here, making use of things in heavy to so reason about possible substitutions. All of these can have like very rich application in terms of reasoning about drugs effects in the body or about just reasoning about, you know, the, the human body and its evolutionary relationship to other bodies as well. So I think there's got to be a three way relationship, that, um, a three way conversation. And there is just there's just so much rich knowledge in these ontologies. I think it's it's really underused at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I guess that points to the question of what what tools and methods are missing. I think there, you know is it uh, outputting the ontology so you know with, with all of the relations pre-computed and uh, developing like, graph embeddings that work well with that, or or do we need more of um, you know, bring the actual logic into the into the machine learning. Because there's a lot of challenges there, and decide kind of which way to do that. Yeah. Okay. And also, I want to comment. So, Gandalf said, 
I'm got confused because I think ontology is hierarchy, right? I think everybody got confused. We are a special community. <laughs> we are building ontology, like complicated relationships. But the machine learners, they only have this, you know, structured data. And uh, one thing we need to do to that community is to kind of guide them through. Because now I talk to people about ontology is like their spectrum. The lowest is terminology taxonomies, pathologies, and then the highest, the most complicated is semantic, which is first of all the logic. And uh, when I have to explain ontology to people who has no idea, like many people have no idea about machine learning because I, 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 I have to, like I gave people, I said, oh, you know what? Ontology is like a network. Everybody knows network and a knowledge graph. Not everybody knows about the knowledge graph, but if you didn't explain them how significant the relationships, how, how, the, how the ontology can compute in a, using a description logic. That is a message we'll have to pass it over to the machine learning uh, community. Okay, uh, so I think just to conclude this Rob, session. Um, yes, sir. There's a very useful comment for Hilmar if you want to go through this. His experience working with ML, which exactly addresses what we're discussing here. It's a comment. Yes, so Hilmar uh, says that the comments that he mostly gets mm -hmm. from machine learning experts is that machine learning deals with individuals as both input and output and ontologies are about classes. So it's not obvious how to integrate both. People lost, lost, they got lost in translation. So that means we should change our way of talking to them as well. Not so, about classes. And this is my, this is my very last uh, question uh, for this discussion. And this is, uh, all of you have mentioned this. And so just to conclude this whole panel discussion and this whole workshop as well, um, what are some ideas on what we can do? So you have all made very good suggestions, but how should, you, where should we go from here? What would be our next steps? Because we have a lot of use cases or we have suggestions for use cases. We have, however, also um, identified need for certain type of knowledge or expertise, which we don't have in our community or not entirely in our community. So we need to connect to other communities as well. So where would we go from here? What's the way forward? What should we do next? Should we just uh, maybe wait for the next ICPO in a year or two and have the next workshop? Or is there something more that we can do? And maybe this is not something to end here because we have about five minutes left before we need to start clearing the room. So maybe this is something, uh, but I will have, I'm not sure, uh, maybe I give the microphone to you if you have some, uh, uh, to some of you in our, of our panelists uh, for some final words, but it's maybe something to continue discussion and discussing for the rest of the conference, or we do this um, if we meet for dinner, if some of you are com coming, so we can continue this for dinner. But maybe uh, if some or all of you or one of you have some uh, last words. Some in spirit on those words. Yes, so obviously we need to keep the conversation going and um, immediately, you know, after this session at dinner, um, and after, during and after the conference, and that could take many forms. Uh, and we all know what those are, typical forms of conversation are, but, um, and, and other ideas like maybe white paper, position paper. Um, uh, maybe we don't wait till ICDO for another meeting. I don't know, just yes. media thoughts. Yeah, I fully agree with the bill. Another thing I want to say is, uh, editing, is uh, I agree with uh, like uh, you all. Like uh, definitely, it's more like a machine learning community. Uh, but however, I feel like uh, it's also our community. Like, we are not only oncology. We are, we have machine learning people here and there, and uh, we want to see if we can make uh, some unique contribution with the focus on oncology as well. To the whole thing of AI, because oncology is part of AI. Machine learning is, is AI, and uh, we are all together.
Yeah, so I, now I can comment like based on my uh, NIH experience. I think I can talk on behalf of NIH. So we have at NIH, there are really a lot of thoughts or activities. People are thinking how to bring, bring the bio, bio, biology community and the computer science community together. So NIH is really interested in that. And then I think NIH here can provide a servant to service to the community to help to organize. So I'm certainly I will be in because the goal of NIH is fund for advance of science. If you don't have right people or you don't have diverse people put together, we don't have uh, creative ideas, we don't have innovation. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to help whoever wants to join. Great. <laughs> Yeah, I think the answer to the question is yes. And I, I like Bill's uh, idea of you know, working on a white paper, a position paper, or something. I kind of wonder if, if we have enough uh, positions to state yet about how ontologies should interact with machine learning, or you know, is there still uh, too many research questions to answer? Okay. In position is that we should do the research. <laughs> research. Okay. <laughs> so I think so. Specific action items. Um, so there's another comment by Nuria online that there is there's a community which may be related, at least in the EU, which is the Alexia machine learning community, which relates to reproducibility and standards, uh, including ontologies for machine learning reproducibility. But of course, it's only one aspect of what we have discussed, but it's a very important anchor point, which would be a natural way to connect. So for now, I think um, I would like to thank our four panelists who have spent the last 90 minutes uh, here. So please let us thank our panelists. And I would like to thank my co-organizer for this, uh, George Hutos, who has been monitoring the Zoom. Um, you can see here now. And I apologize for not being there with you. I'm sorry. Um, I, I promise I'll be there next time. And I hope that um, I uh, many of you will join for the dinner at 7 p.m. Uh, 